Okay, so hi everyone. So we have Dr. Jeffrey Rosenberg today. Um, he is an orthopedic surgeon, has completed has completed orthopedic training in the UK and Sydney, and his major interest is spinal surgery, primarily um, adult generative, degenerative spinal conditions. Um, this includes reconstruction, arthroplasty, and minimally um, invasive surgery. He also performs robotic spinal surgery and performs arthroplasty of hip and knee um, and endoscopy. Um, he has been on the Federal Training Committee of the Australian Orthopedic um, Association for the last 10 years. And Dr. Rosenberg also regularly participates in humanitarian missions to the Pacific with the orthopedic outreach, as well as, as Africa with Australian Doctors for Africa. So over to you, Dr. Rosenberg. All right. Hello, all. Um, um, my name is Jeff Rosenberg. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, what I'm trying to do, Sophia. Ah, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Okay. So um, I've been doing this for about five years now, but I'm still in practice. I mean, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. My generation still does a lot of hip and knee. All of us do, but I mainly do spine because I guess I'm a sucker for punishment. And the reason I got into the medico legal side of things, I got sick of my patients getting mucked around by experts who, as you people would all know, not everyone is an expert just because they got doctor in front of their name. So you have retired physicians or surgeons, general surgeons, offering expert advice about uh, sort of spinal conditions, which really annoyed me. So that's why I started doing it. Um, and I actually quite enjoy it. And it's it's nice because most of the stuff I see are people like I see day in, day out of, uh, in my usual, my clinical side of my practice. And it's rewarding. It's rewarding. Just, you know, that you can steer people the right way or people, you know, not everyone is uh, being jerked around or thought of as a malingerer, but nevertheless, anyway, it's interesting. So it's all about back pain. And obviously it's very prevalent, particularly in Western societies, huge amount of uh, presentations to everyone, but particularly to do with work cover and work injuries. Um Certainly from my perspective, it's all in the history. So when a 20-year-old walks in, you're not immediately thinking arthritis of the spine. You're thinking either a disc or maybe a congenital thing like a PARS defect that's become symptomatic. Um, the examination helps but adds little. It's all in the history. It's all in the history. Um, radiology as well is helpful, but it's sort of overdone in this country. Like a lot of people come and see someone like me because I'm a cheaper way to get an MRI. And if you actually sit and talk to people and tell them what you think's going on and uh, and maybe hopefully reassure them, and I, I just tell them we'll have the same conversation with or without an MRI. Why don't you try this and this? And if it's not getting better, come back for an MRI. Because a huge amount of the cost of medicine in this country is not just the surgery, it's the investigations. Um, oh, sorry. Stacy, is that you talking? Uh, um, so, you know, you really try to do tests that are appropriate. Certainly a lying down x-ray of the spine is a waste of time. Being an orthopedic surgeon, traditionally we understood stability or instability much better than the neurosurgeons, but it's starting to come together. Certainly in the States, orthopedic spine surgeons and neurosurgeons start there. And by five years, they're usually operating together. In this country, there's a bit of crossover, but still, you know, there is a separation. There is a separation. So, you know, it's just how it is. It's not that I'm always right and they're wrong or vice versa, but you do what works in your hands. But um, you'll find classically someone's been under the care of a neurosurgeon. They've had hot and cold running MRIs. And the first thing I do is get a standing X-ray. And it's amazing how often you'll see a subtle forward slip or a sideways slip or something that explains. Because all the bog standard CTs and MRIs are done when they're lying down. And things aren't happening when they're lying down more often than not. So we don't really have the technology to see what's happening. You can tell historically, but the future, hopefully you can see me, is that you get an MRI the size of my phone, strap it to your back, hit record, and see what happens when they're actually up and doing things. Yes, in Sydney, we do have one upright MRI, but even that's a bit artificial. It's done with them standing, bending, and straightening. 
and similarly sitting, bending and straightening, but you're only taking static shots. I mean, often the instability or the more protrusion of the disc, for instance, is in the mid-range of movement, and we're not imaging. So, I mean, we've only got what we've got, and you do the best you can. But once again, it all goes back to the history. I mean, total body pain, forget about it. When does it hurt? All the time. When does it hurt? Oh, when I'm asleep at night. I mean, you know, you've got to try and um, work out what is going on. You can't treat total body pain. Um, so things that I dislike seeing... A lot of the patients don't because a lot of this stuff is uh, bulk billed, meaning you and me, the taxpayer, have to pay for it. But multiple CT scans. CT scan is a very good test. It's much less radiation than it used to be, but it still costs money. And it's it's good for looking at the bony anatomy, but it's no good for looking at the discs and the soft tissues. It can give you a hint and an outline, but it's not as good. Annual bone scans as well. Um, I mean, different horses, different courses. The first thing rheumatologists will order is a bone scan. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't do it as a first line. But, you know, it's all important, but, you know, you order things appropriately. Nothing's likely to change. Uh, and you don't monitor people by doing annual CTs or bone scans and, indeed, multiple MRIs. Ultrasound, absolutely useless investigation. Bone mineral density is good, but, once again, in general medical good practice, you know, checking their bone density, but uh, and unnecessary injections. This is a great thing uh, that is a source of irritation. Um, often the seat, I mean, there's an oversupply, as you all know, of every specialist in the big cities these days. There's three times the number of orthopods compared to when I first started practice because we're training too many. And you don't you don't make your big bucks unless you're operating or doing things. So you'll often get an X-ray report saying, yes, there's this, there's that, there's the other. Uh, if appropriate, we could arrange an injection. And the, the GP, well-intentioned, doesn't quite know. I think that might be a good thing. And 40% of things you see on any X-ray or scan, they're incidental, but they're not actually causing the problem. I have the luxury of talking to the patient, examining the patient, then determining what I think is wrong and then looking on the CT or the MRI. But in fairness to the radiologists, a lot of them, they get the referral, it just says back pain. So it's very hard, whereas I will send them a referral saying, you know, back and leg pain, query four or five discs, something like that. And it's not that I'm so smart, but that's what I'm doing. And that's why I'm ordering the test. So, you know, there's a lot of people who come and they've had injections that were never going to work because they've had them at the wrong level. Um, so appropriate investigations not as a first off, but after several months of not getting better, better or whatever, they need standing films, including flexion extension views. Very important test. Readily available. Most of the x-ray places don't charge. CT scans got a role to play. Uh, usually most of the people who have CT scans, they come, they arrive with them already. In my world, I'll do a CT scan if I'm worried about uh, screws or, or the implants are in the wrong position or to try and get an idea, a handle on how the fusion is progressing. Um, but multiple CT scans, I mean, it's just it's, it's just a waste of time and money. A CT myelogram, that's gone out the window. It is a useful test, but it doesn't exist anymore. It's invasive. Uh, I had one patient, the worst patient, worst CSF leak I've ever experienced, someone post myelogram. And it just, people don't do them anymore. Uh, an MRI, well, you know, if you have a sore nose, people want an MRI. It has a role to play. It's good. It's useful. Um, the big thing is with implants, uh, they're all titanium now, so you don't get too much distortion. But obviously, the big the big problem is a lot of the patients are old. They've all got pacemakers. The newer pacemakers are MRI compatible. The older ones aren't, so they really can't have it. Uh, but the problem is that a, a worrying thing has emerged. There's one place in Sydney, the in Darlinghurst, where they seem to be the only place that are happy to do MRIs uh, in people who have pacemakers, even though they're MRI compatible. But it seems to be they get the company involved. The company comes out there, they do it. The patient's $800 out of pocket. All Mr. Insurance firm is $800 plus out of pocket, which seems a huge thing. So I, I really try to avoid that. A dynamic MRI is a set, an upright one, sitting and standing. A bone scan is useful. I'll do it if I'm worried about I really don't know what's going on. They have pain out of all proportion of what seems reasonable. Uh, a discogram, controversial test, someone who you truly believe is genuine, but there's not much to see. 
So a discogram is a provocative test. If you stick a needle in a disc, it hurts. If you stick a needle in a disc that's causing problems, it's problematic. In theory, it should momentarily reproduce your typical back end or leg pain. But it only gives you the answer you expect about two thirds of the time. So it is a test. It is, there's a bunch of people say it's a waste of time. There's a bunch of people say it's useful. Uh, but once again, it hurts. It's not a nice test. I hardly ever do it. But going back to all my things about radiological findings, treat the patients, not the x-ray. Up to 40% of things you see on a scan are incidental. You know, hello, I'm Jeff Rosenberg. What's the problem? I have five bulging discs. Okay, you've had a scan. Why have you had the scan? What's the problem? Um, so you have to take certain things with a grain of salt. So things that are really of concern, and particularly if uh, I'm, I'm sure you get inundated with requests for surgery, but when you see someone with progressive neurology or someone with a quarter equina syndrome or someone with significant weakness or then lesser down the thing, severe pain, you know, they're fairly, well, the first three in particular are pretty urgent. Like you've almost missed the boat. The time to get a quarter equina syndrome is in hospital and be in theatre in a few hours, but definitely within 48 hours. And significant dysesthesias like not just a bit of numbness and tingling, but like hot ants crawling up and down their leg, uh, really unpleasant, burning, deep, dead as a dodo numbness. Um, with all the tingling and numbness and pins and needles, people equate that with they're about to be paralysed. If something pushes on the nerve, be it a bit of disc or bone or whatever, all the chemicals that mediate inflammation are sucked into the area and you get swelling around the nerve. You can't see it to look at the patient. You can't see it on any scans, but it's there. And when you get swelling around a nerve, you get numbness, tingling, pins and needles. If it continues, it becomes painful. So it's not a matter of incipient paralysis. With these significant dysesthesias, in my experience, if you don't operate on them properly, they never get better. And that signifies, I, I believe, the disc is like somehow infarcting the nerve. It's it's kinking off the, the artery to that nerve and it's really compromised. And Early in my career, I did a couple late and they didn't do any good because I'm a, I'm a rubbish surgeon, not because there was bad pathology happening that wasn't picked up. Um, so you've got all these things with physio, chiro, osteopath, acupuncture, wet needles, dry needles, massage. I mean, there's millions of types of massage. I think they're all the same. It's just a matter of how hard you push. And with all these things, there's only one scientific study that suggests that a short burst of physio for a month with acute back pain helps. It's not that the other things don't help. But, you know, there's been no scientific study proving they help. Um, the reality is if you go to whoever and they do whatever, great. But if it doesn't, you've got to stop it. And I constantly see people and I've learned to ask, well, what does the physio do? Uh, they put a machine that thumps me a bit or gives me a little buzz and then they disappear for 20 minutes. That's not physio. It's all rubbish. Um, you know, that's sort of really over-treating and charging you guys, the insurers and the payers an enormous amount of money. Um, it's all about personal responsibility. It's all, you know, for the acute phase, what happens, the body tries to go into protection mode. The body says, if it don't move, it don't hurt. And you get muscle spasm. And all these modalities work on the secondary pathology, which is the muscle spasm. The only thing that can help is the natural history of the problem. And hopefully that, that is to resolve, or in the worst case scenario, scenario you know, the brutal surgeon. But it's not to say oh, the surgeon is the only one can help. All these modalities have a role to play. But when you see people who have been having physio for two years after an injury, and now they do it once a fortnight, it's like getting a haircut. I mean, you sort of do it. And, and if nothing else, some of them, it gives them something to do, something to look forward to. But really, it's a waste of time after a certain point of time. I think all these things are good initially, but it's really up to the patient who needs to start doing you know, their own self-directed program, uh, they need to swim, they need to do Pilates, all aimed at core strengthening techniques. So, yeah, this beautiful slide. The aim of surgery overall is nerve decompression, try and relieve the pain and to stabilise the spine. So that's now getting to the crunch of it. Um, well, with a lot of this stuff, I can improve you, I can't cure you, you'll recover well, but you've got to modify. It's not okay to be an enormous overweight slob. I'm constantly turning into a dietitian. When you're over 50, you don't lose weight by exercising. It just stops you getting fatter. Uh, it maintains. And bottom line is that what goes in, if you don't eat, you're not fat. Oh, you know, I've put on 30 kilos since I've hurt my hand, my wrist, my back. It's I can't move. I can't exercise. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense. So I'm not, I have zero sympathy for that. Uh, it needs 
um, some responsibility and onus on the patient. So, you know, if I was you sitting there and you get, here's Rosenberg, well, he wanted to decompress last week and this week he wants to fuse or he wants to do this, he wants to do that. You know, so that's the gist of this court talk. I mean, and I'll, I'll talk about it more in a minute, but, you know, if they're unstable, you've got to stabilise them, largely because of housekeeping issues. Otherwise, the problem will come back. But, you know, most of the time, young people, they get a big slip disc. They're not getting better. They failed non-operative treatment, not conservative treatment. That's a bad word to use, but non-operative treatment. And they're not getting better. And it's reasonable to operate on them, particularly if they have severe pain or progressive weakness, or they're just not getting better. That's the usual thing. The natural history of a disc is to get better, it, but usually within three weeks, they're starting to improve, definitely within 12 weeks. But, you know, it's these people you see, they've had problems for three years, they can't work. If they sit around and vegetate at home, they're okay. If they do anything, they're, they're stuffed. And, you know, I just tell them, well, you won't get better without an operation. I mean, it's up to 10 years, you might be better, but surgery gets you better quicker. And I, my belief is, I mean, you go to spine meetings and they have these sort of sort of fun debates like early intervention, late, and, you know, one week, you know, Joe Blow's arguing early, whereas his friend is arguing late, and then the next week they're arguing the other side. I mean, my personal experience is an observation over nearly 30 years of practice, people with severe leg pain that is not getting better with a big disc do better much quicker. They don't have, they're much less likely to have residual symptoms. And it's it's routine surgery has an 80 to 90% chance of them being completely better and they'll be fine. And the usual ongoing issues here are that, you know, if, particularly if it's a big disc protrusion, the remnant of the disc can be weak and they can rumble along. Occasionally they can get a recurrent protrusion, but usually the disc deteriorates if you follow them with MRIs, but I don't unless there's a reason to. Um, you know, they might be more prone to back pain. So in 10 years' time, they're as good or as bad with or without surgery, but surgery is just to help them get better quicker. And as long as they look after themselves, maybe modify their body, modify the work they do, and the gods are smiling on them, they should be fine. The best operation we do is a laminectomy. It's the hip replacement of back surgery. Predictably good results, excellent results. And because you don't have a, a disc, I guess you've got older people, part of the ageing process is the spinal canal gets narrower, the bones get thicker, the ligaments get thicker, the discs start to bulge out, they diminish in height. Um, and that's a normal finding. If you get 100, you know, 75-year-olds, they've all got stenosis, but not all of them have problems. Um, but predictably good results. And so those first two are all about decompressing the spine. I mean, they used to talk about discectomy, neurolysis for our monotomy. They've simplified it all. You're decompressing either one level, two levels. doesn't matter whether you shave a disc or the bone. It's making room for the nerves. And, you know, it's a bit like hip surgery. If you don't do well after that, either there's something wrong with you or your surgeon. And the usual reasons the first two operations might not work at all, uh, you might operate at the wrong level. But I'm pretty sure, I know what I do, and I'm pretty sure everyone does, you get x-rays you got to, for medical legal reasons, just to prove I've operated at the right level. Uh, but you can't give a 100% guarantee. The only 100% guarantee I have is that I'll do the best operation I can. Um, but, you know, you give people realistic recoveries. As you all know, self-employed people go back to work much sooner because they got to. The place is falling to bits. Um, whereas other people might not be as motivated. Um Disc replacement, I probably did as many, if not more, disc, lumbar disc replacements than anyone in Sydney, but I haven't done them for 15 years for a reason, because I don't reckon they work. Because, you know, unless the disc is fairly collapsed, you know, it's too big an ask. So when you've got a disc that's of good height with an annular tear, it's too big an ask. A lot of them, the early prostheses were a bit unconstrained. There was too much movement. People would come back. I've had five great years now. I'm in agony. And it's because their facet joints got stressed and overloaded. So you do a pedicle screw fusion behind and they're fine. Um, a lot of people, I mean, for the neck, it's completely different. I'm not going to talk about that. It works. It's great. But for the lumbar spine, I don't think it's so great. The majority of usage is still if people are doing a two-level fusion, for instance, they'll fuse one level and they'll do a disc replacement at the level above. So it's not a rigid fix. So there's a more 
gentle drop off as regards stresses and loads through the levels. So you've got an absolutely rigid lowest level, four, five's got a bit of mobility, so three, four's not being overloaded too much. Um, they were trying to come out with figures that prove definitively adjacent segment problems are much less with disc replacement. It sort of makes sense that it is, but they haven't proven it definitively. So um, I should quickly say that's the other thing, this, the gift that keeps giving. Oh, if I have a spinal fusion, I'm on this bandwagon and I'm going to end up needing the next level fused and then the next level, like a house, a domino effect. Basically, you've got about a 10% chance within 10 years after a fusion of the next level becoming so symptomatic that that needs fusing. However, that's not in everyone. That's in old people who are riddled with arthritis, people who have lots of spine surgeries, people who have a very long fusion, multi-level, three, four-level fusion to start off with, or people who have a laminectomy above a long fusion. They're all doomed to sort of wear out quickly. Um, but if you do a one-level fusion on a young person with a PARS defect, you know, they won't be back in 10 years needing the next level done, or very, very rarely. So that's not a compelling argument. So fusion, the reason I fuse. And unfortunately, I've left I've left the slide off. I apologise. So when you have a big, significant spondylolisthesis, and particularly when the disc is good height, not if the disc is collapsed and, you know, it's jammed in, then you, you don't need to do that. If they have a significant degenerative scoliosis, if they have vertical facet joints, and I'll show you examples of all this. If they've got facet joint cysts, if they have a huge disc, replay, disc protrusion or a recurrent disc protrusion and the disc is worn out, uh, you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, indications, but most of the time you're fusing them so the problem doesn't come back. You know, the major thing is they often come, I've had years of back pain, it's manageable, now I can't walk, I have leg pain. And this is part of the degeneration and, and you're really treating the leg pain. You're doing the fusion so the problem doesn't come back as housekeeping. And, you know, that's what you need. So, okay, of course, I couldn't show you someone simple. I had to show you a dramatic disc. So here's a lumbar sacral disc, bit of degeneration. Look at four or five above it, good height. Here, spitting out. Uh, and here it's gigantic. So I actually saw someone like this with scans like this very early in my practice, and their only symptom was if they walked too far, they had a bit of numbness in their leg. And the guy said, what should I do? I said, buy a lottery ticket. But most of the time, people like this would have severe pain, significant weakness. They would often have a crossover straight leg raise, not just a straight leg raise on the symptomatic side, but uh, you, you lift the other leg and they get their same pain down the contralateral leg. That indicates either a huge disc or a disc jammed under the nerve, and they just don't get better without surgery. So someone like this, if the game is fair, would do well. But someone like this, going back to this, may well be left with just r residual back pain. The disc is already a bit shitty. There's a bit of edema in the MRI, uh, in the bone on the MRI. So it's, these are modic changes, you know, mean degeneration. And it's a huge disc. So the rest of this, if they're lucky, they'll get away with it. What would I do if this was my back? If I just had leg pain, I'd just have that. And don't worry, I'll cope with it. I mean, I'm a last resort. Here's someone else, a large disc. Uh, this is a 30-year-old. I saw these are all real people. I saw this guy. He's had pretty unremitting pain for six months. What do I do? And he's tried everything. He's had appropriate injections. He's tried physio. He's tried this EO. He's tried that EO. And he's still pain. I said, seriously, you won't get better in a hurry without an operation. He's either gone to someone else who's just terrified, so I don't know what's happened to him. Uh, you see here just a big disc to the symptomatic side. So, you know, this guy has an 80 to 90% of doing really well after surgery this is the other this is the winner you know this is someone who's older say he's 70 for the sake of argument on a ct obviously very tight canal you can't see any fat or fluid around a big thick facet joints disc bulging out they talk about ligamentum hypertrophy ligamentum flavor ligaments don't hypertrophy it's just as the disc collapses the ligament, which basically buffers and cushions the uh, spinal cord, concertina is down like a piano accordion. So there's more of it in less room, in less space, but it's not hypertrophy. Um, here's someone else, 35-year-old woman with a you know big slip disc to the left. You know, these people don't need fusions. They just need a discectomy. And be warned, you've got a big disc. 
it uh so here you know she this is the same one yeah 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 so she's got her this disc is all right this disc is fairly ratty okay but and she's got some stenosis but you know i just do a decompression they're not unstable um they can live with their back pain oh no this is someone else sorry 53 and 35 look the same so yeah this is now this is someone else this is i was actually recently in tonga i sort of my sins go and save lives in tonga i go to bog holes in africa that stopped since covid but the polynesians all have spinal canal stenosis so most of the time you're operating on winners and you know i've been there enough i know what we can do what's safe to do um you're doing them prone lying on pillows so these big fat tongans so they bleed a lot more you don't have a cell saver you don't you know anyway you do what you do so this for instance is someone with a really ratty worn out disc and stenosis now you could make an argument for if they just have stenosis they only have leg pain they can live with their back pain leave it alone but if they've got a lot of leg pain uh back pain sorry you'd probably fuse them and this is the this is the level above, same thing. So I think from memory, without shooting myself in the foot, I just did a laminectomy on that one. So fusion. I do have the slide. Here it is. So they're all the first ones I showed you are just people you decompress. Their main problem is leg pain and they get better. They get better. But if they're unstable, so they've got a spondylolisthesis, that's one bone is slipped forward on the other. And often you only see a tiny bit on a CT or an MRI but you do a standing x-ray, it's obvious. If they have a significant degenerative scoliosis, if their facet joints are disrupted, they got cysts. Uh, uh, if you're having to do multi-level decompressions, you know, an aggressive surgeon would fuse them. Previous surgery, that's more the ones who have a recurrent disc. The disc is fairly ratty you could, and they've got a lot of back pain. You could make an argument for fusing them and recurrent discs. And these are this is not an absolute list. You know, it's it's not extended. You can, I, can, I can double it in size at least. You really do what works in your hands and whatever. But the most most of the time, if they're unstable. So this, this is a very typical pattern we see, a very stiff degenerate lowest disc over the years puts pressure on the facet joints and now they've got to slip at four on five. And the classic story of someone like this, I've had years of back pain. I can cope with it get a bit of groin pain, which is a referred pain from the lumbar sacral disc. Now I get leg pain because they're getting stenosis here. And also the disc is narrow. So L5 is being trapped here and also out there. I can't walk. And they give symptoms of spinal claudication. So here's the dilemma for you guys and also for me. Because I tell these patients, it's not that work cover don't believe you. It's all about liability. So you don't get arthritis by getting up and going to work, particularly if you have a sedentary job. Oh, I never had a problem until I sort of stumbled or whatever. I mean, this is not 100% going to become symptomatic, but if they have one big accident, it, that sort of tips them over the edge. But then you don't know. You can't say with any certainty whether it will become bad enough. But someone like this, when the disc is good height, above a stiff disc, there is a big argument for having to fuse them. And in my hands, I fuse them as housekeeping. The main thrust of the surgery is to decompress them but I would fuse people like this. Obviously, with our ageing population, like 80-year-olds, I haven't met an 80-year-old work cover yet with osteoporotic bone. You'd be more reluctant to, but, you know, a younger person, I would be fusing. So you see a very stiff degenerate disc. Four or five is protruding. You see here's, here's all the nerves quite kinked there, very narrow there, big wide facet joints. Um you can't see much of a slip here because this is they're lying down. It's evident on the standing x-ray more often than not. So, you know, empirically in my hands and, and most spine surgeons' hands, you'd be fusing it. You'd be doing the winner-winner operation, which is decompressing them. So you would know there's a lot of people still working in their 70s, but, you know, it's hard. You don't get an arthritic knee by going to work. I guess certain jobs you do with what you do, but you don't necessarily. So, but I never had a problem in my life. I said, well, I find that hard to believe. So it is very hard. It is very hard. And I just try to explain, even though I'm not meant to give much away. It's not that they don't believe you. It's about liability. And there are some people who is no doubt they're just BSing you. They've obviously had problems. You go through the doctor's notes. 
that the lawyers have sent you and they've had years of back pain and they've had treatments and operate and injections and stuff like that. Oh, no, but I was perfect after that. Never had a problem, you know. So certainly work might have been a partial contributor, but not the only contributor. Uh, you know, once it, this is so common, this x-ray. Someone else, CT, a very stiff disc, slip above and a very tight stenosis. Big, thick, wide facet joints. Here's another one. Here's a pars defect in a six-year-old. So just because you've got a pars defect, which is a weak disc behind, they're born with a congenital gap, and it's not a bony ring, and it feels full of thick, fibrous tissue. And often it's stable, okay? So even in someone like this, where over their lifetime, the disc has worked harder, so it's worn out, the bone's starting to slip forward, often you'll find these people aren't necessarily symptomatic. So up to 5% of the population have PARS defects, and yet 5% of the population are not lining up for spinal fusions. Um, but then you find, so it's a stable pseudarthrosis. But then they have one big accident, like you get the handyman who's worked hard all his life, said, yeah, my back aches from time to time, I'll fiber do it. But then they fall down the stairs or the ladder collapses, and they basically tear through this fibrous pseudarthrosis, and that never heals, and they never get better without fusing them. And someone like this, you can't go in and just do a laminectomy or whatever and free the nerve. You categorically have to fuse them. Otherwise, you're just doing two operations. The first one won't help at all. So you see this a lot. Um, and and they are quite genuine that, you know, once again, oh, but it would have become symptomatic in any case. And the ones who have had no problems, genuinely, it's unlikely that they would have. So it's largely on work, um, you know, or that work-related accident. And here you see it's a gap. And this, the body thinks it's a, it's a fracture, which it's not, and is furiously trying to heal it. So when you operate on these people, particularly if you open them up from behind, you'll see this thick fibrous tissue that's squashing the light out, life out of the L5 nerve root in the exophoramen, and yet they really haven't been symptomatic until recently, and you just can't believe how that is, but it is. Here, this is someone who's had some sort of inappropriate decompression years ago, and you can see here's the facet joint on the right. There ain't no facet joint on the left. So that's Dr. Yatros, the iatrogenic surgery they've caused a problem and this person you know with a standing x-ray completely unstable so they will have back pain they have leg pain sure lying down they've got plenty of room for the nerves but standing up and the nerves stuck in scar tissue the bones are going to slip and be unstable toggling all over the place so this person's going to have significant back and leg pain far worse with standing and walking that's the usual history here's the other thing is you see someone in their mid to late 60s who works hard has worked hard all their life yeah i've got a bad back but then something happens, they stumble, they have one thing that's not that bad, and they present like this. Degenerate lumbar sacral disc, slip four, five, slip three, four, slip two, three, multi-level stenosis. You know, these sort of people pose a dilemma because it's an all or nothing approach for them. This, this person really needs an L2 to S1 because you can't sit there. I guess you could do a bone scan to see which level is worse affected. Uh but all of them are. And, and something like this is not on work. You know, the classic is someone with an arthritic knee. No, my knee never hurt until I twisted it. And now they've got a degenerate meniscal tear and arthritis. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not on work. It's not on work. You know, you could try an arthroscopy, for instance, but it might give them temporary relief, won't, won't do anything for the arthritis. So someone like this, I mean, to my mind, if I was paying the bills, I wouldn't pay, pay for it. Luckily, this I remember this woman. She's a nice lady. She's not work cover. You'll be pleased to know. But, you know, she's had years of back pain and put up with it, but now she's got leg pain. And they need an all or nothing. So it's very hard when they come with a work-related sort of under work cover. I don't believe it's on you. I mean, I think, yes, the latest episode has contributed to it, but almost certainly this was going to become problematic. And you can see the body's trying to heal itself. This disc is very stiff. This one's pretty stiff almost immobilized this one's still got some height so probably if you're only allowed to and this one is going that way too if you're only allowed to operate on one level i guess you do three four and keep your fingers crossed that that was the one but you just don't know it's sort of like in situations like this the ultimate diagnostic test is surgery if it works you're a, you're a legend if it doesn't oh well it's those other levels 
that you can't operate like that on a whim. And it's very hard. This is just her x-rays, just plop, plop, like a house of cards. And it's even worse on these ones because these are the standing x-rays with the CT. So you can fuse. I mean, you're fusing someone. The bog standard workhorse is to go from behind, okay? You can go anteriorly. Anteriorly is preferable, particularly in younger people, because you can get a much better exposure of the disc, cut much more of it out, and put in a much bigger implant. Um, and that's the advantage of it. Um, uh, with There's sort of much less, well, there's no disruption to the muscles behind um, if you go that way. So it's it's less blood loss and they heal quicker. And it's got less connotations to do with developing adjacent segment problems. Because if you operate from behind, you must cause some disruption to the facet joints at the next level. Uh, and that's the advantage of it. Can't do it in everyone. People will have abundant surgery. we uh, abdominal surgery for other reasons. Everything's stuck down. Um, sometimes the vascular anatomy is really weird and you don't know that until you get in there. It, smokers have a real problem with everything stuck down. Um, I used to do my own approaches. These days, in this medical legal environment in which we live and work, I get an access surgeon. Just about everyone in Sydney does now. Makes my life easier. Because the hard bit for me for this operation is deciding who to do it on. Uh, and it used to be getting down there. Now I don't worry. I have a very experienced vascular surgeon who spends fully 50% of his time now uh, doing approaches for spine surgeons. So it's a very good industry for these guys. And they're very skilled at what they do. Um, the problem with an anterior, I, I don't believe that standalone anterior works anymore because you, you you get some people, you get away with it, other people, you don't. And they never do that well and they start to get their symptoms back again. And even though they've got a seemingly solid fusion, they still toggle through the facet joints. So I now back them up straight away. People don't like to be told, listen, I'm pretty sure I can help you significantly, but there's a chance you'll have to come back in 12 months for another operation. Oh, I'm coming in once fix me, do what you want. So in America, for instance, they don't do standalone anteriors very, very rarely. And I see a lot of people who have had operations well done by good surgeons, but only standalone, they still got problems. So they go thinking it's the next level. It's not, it's not. And I see a lot of it because they get sick of being told there's nothing wrong or I've done my best, everything's good. And you send them for facet joint injections, they lose all their pain, so you put screws in. Laterals, lateral is coming in from the side. So truly, uh, anterior is not minimally invasive surgery, but lateral is. It's a tiny cut. You go through through the psoas muscle or just forward to it, and we now have the technology that we can navigate our way through. That's really good. It's a very powerful tool, um, and it's a very good operation. Or you can do it combination, but you can't. In osteoporotic bone, you can't do it as standalone. At L4-5, you can't do it as standalone. Uh, you need to back it up with pedicle screws. So I'm lucky in that I do all of these and I I don't sit there as I'm the anterior king and I do everyone through the front. There are some guys and girls who do that. You know, I, I do what works for me and I, I you know, uh, decide what surgery is best for the patient based on their anatomy and what their pathology is. So that's why you see different things. I mean, at the end of the day, a fusion is a fusion the item numbers are the same. It's now an anterior interbody fusion, whether you go from behind or the side or the front, whereas before it all used to be different, which caused confusion. But empirically, it doesn't matter how the surgeon's doing it, they're still doing a fusion for the reasons I said. And, you know, certainly when I first started, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of the older neurosurgeons would only do laminectomies and they didn't get better, they'd do another laminectomy, it didn't get better, they thought about maybe doing a fusion. Whereas today we know from these ones that you've got to fuse them. So as an orthopedic spine surgeon, not just me, but most orthopods who do spine, most of what we do is fuse because that's what we see. It's not that we're aggressive so-and-sos, but we are, but we're not aggressive so-and-sos. Um, we see people who we believe best is, they need a fusion. Interestingly, as I get older and wiser and more cynical, in older people, I do less fusions because they might be unstable, but they're lower demand. They've got really osteoporotic bone. It's hard to rigidly fix mashed potato. So I'll just do a, a lesser operation. And I'll explain why to them, because the, the complication rate from the implants is so high, it's just not worth it. So I stopped doing it. Um, 
And with fixing them, you might be doing screws from behind, cages in between, uh, plates and screws together. You just do whatever. And there's all that's lateral. You're going in from the side. Why go lateral? It's min it's truly minim minimally invasive, and you get a very powerful correction. Today, most of the implants are 3D printed. They're titanium. Bone loves titanium. Titanium loves bone. That's an anterior cage. That's an anterior cage without the screws in it. That's a posterior cage. They're all titanium. The downside of titanium, on X-ray, you can't. You, it, it's sort of not radiolucent, so it's hard to see the bone growing through it. But you see the bone growing around it. Uh, but still, it's much better. MRI, it's MRI compatible. It's fine. More cages, implants. You can see the bone growing through it. And that's pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of major cages used to be made of peak polyether ether ketone, which very closely matches the modulus, meaning the stiffness of the bone. But nothing happens. It's a completely inert substance. So the advantage of it is you can see the bone and what's happening with the grafting much clearer, but it's not as good. So no, and this is like a peak cage. These are peak cages. Uh, this, I put this one up. Once again, you might get this with a work cover case, but not usually. This was a woman years ago. She's had by increments uh, three to five fusion, three to one fusion, and she comes in with terrible L2-3 symptoms. Majorly retrolysthes, lots of stenosis on CTs and MRIs, what I won't show you. So 15 years into my practice, along comes laterals. This is perfect. You just go a standalone lateral cage at this level. You can do it with a couple of screws on the side. Perfect. You know, half an hour operation, uh, five mils of blood loss, minimal pain up and at them straight away, great. Whereas in the old days, you've had to cut them open, remove the rods, join it all up, put screws in. Whereas in my hands, that's why lateral is so good. Uh, this is probably this is the last uh, disc replacement I did. He's got a degenerate lumbar sacral, four or five is bulging out, and he had a lot of pain there because um, he did. You just have to trust me on that one. That That's someone, that's a two-level anterior cage. Today, if I did that, I would back it up with screws. Um, yeah, this is the one I was saying. So here, here's a standalone fusion cage, and above it, this is a disc replacement. That's retractors. This was done intraoperative. The guy never came back to see me. I rang him a year later, said, what's going on? He said, no, I'm fine, Doc. That's the problem. Some people are just real dopes. They never come back. They come back when there's a catastrophic problem, like... What do you mean no one told you to come back? Of course you were told. Anyway, but I just don't do disc replacements anymore for the reasons I said. This is another one perfect for a lateral. I've done here. I fused that years ago. Then this level wore out. Uh, I took these screws out, just piggybacked up here. Then this one became symptomatic. So once again, a truly minimally invasive. Look at the preoperative. See how high the disc is? Much higher. You're physically jacking it up, like jacking up a tyre to change it. Minimally invasive, much better. Uh, what's this one? Can't even remember. Am I boring you? Have I talked enough yet or not? Are we out of time, Sophia? No, no, no. You should be fine. Um, we got a few questions coming through in the chat. Yeah. Well, natural here, so it's... Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, I mean, these are just more things. Oh, I'll just show you this one. Here's someone they've got stenosis. There's a big facet joint cyst. So the old days people suggested, and, they, and this person presents with significant leg pain. And these people always become unstable. And in the old days, they used to get the uh, radiologist try and pop it. Doesn't work because it's thick, viscous jelly. Try to eject it with cortisone. Doesn't work. You can remove it. But you see already, look how wide the facet joints are. So if they're a younger person, I would fuse them. With an older person, I'd keep my fingers crossed, just decompress them to a cystectomy. Uh, Yeah, this is someone just recently I saw in Tonga had a disc 15 years ago, a discectomy, and that's how he is now. It's slipped forward. It's all degenerate, worn and torn, terrible back pain and leg pain. So I just fused him. There's no interbody because I'm in Tonga. So I just did that. That's what I get away with. Listen, I can keep babbling on here, but I think that's enough. That's enough. I've probably bored you enough. But you can see it's just, oh, yeah, this is someone I saw recently, 15 years after a fusion. Uh, didn't come back to see me, even though she loved me. Uh, her, had a new GP who sent her to a neurosurgeon who's since retired, did a laminectomy because she had three, four stenosis. That's the long-term thing three years afterwards. Completely slipped it. You know, 
you, you've got to above a fusion. If you're doing a significant laminectomy, you've got to fuse them or this will happen. And it did. Uh, that's Well, that's all I have. That's all I have. Um, so how do I unshare my screen so we can talk? Is that what I should do? Um, you yeah. can just leave the screen on there. Oh, okay. Um, but, yeah, um, so we have a question coming through from Beth um, in yep. the chat box. I'm not sure if you can see the chat box, but I'm I can't. Just... I can't at all. <laughs> That's all good. Um, so she said that loving the talk, hoping to get your thoughts on radio frequency ablation. Also seeing, uh, and she said good that question. also seeing a lot of workers with no improvement after fusions. Do you have any thoughts on why that would be and any suggestions you okay. have? So RFA, I, I, you find some of my neurosurgical colleagues will do, do their own um, injections, their own RFAs. Okay, I don't do that. If I if I see a patient, they're asleep in theatre, they're asleep. Okay, I'm operating on them. I send them to interventional radiologists. RFA, I have a very dim view. That's the domain of the pain management people, because RFA, you're basically zapping the facet joints. But if they've got a disc problem, it's completely illogical to me how doing an RFA will help. There is no doubt some people with non-specific back pain and whatever do get relief, but if you've got a disc problem and discogenic pain and a positive discogram and all that, doing RFAs is a waste of time. So I get a very jaded picture because I don't see people who go to the chiropractor and have whatever done and they're fine. I see the people who are jerked around. And similarly with RFAs, I see the people who just in the last year, you know, they've been in the hands of the pain management people and they've often had RFAs done you know, for the lower three levels clockwise and anti-clockwise, and they'll do it again and then again. And then when that hasn't worked, they decide it's the sacroiliac joint, you know. And then I remember one guy I saw, I mean, this is anecdotal, non-scientific, but this is what I see regularly, so which is why I have a jaded view of it. Um, and I said, okay, stand up and take your shoes off. Why? I want to examine you. Why? No one else has. Where are your x-rays? Uh, I left them at home. I got sick of dra dragging around. No one looked at them. So this is not all of them, but this is a few of them. And, you know, they just wanted RFA or inject everything. I saw one guy, I had to do a medical legal recently for an insurance firm, and the guy's got back problems and he's got a referred pain down his knee. And the pain manager guy wants to do RFA in his back, which I said is illogical. He's got a problem with his disc. But they also want to zap the geni inferior geniculate nerve or something to try and help his knee pain. I said, there's nothing wrong with his knee. So why would you be treating that? It's a referred pain from his back. So I'm, I, I try to be very fair and kind, but sometimes it really irritates me, some of the advice and the treatment. You know, I, I have a, you know, I come from a medical background and I have a degree of cynicism. So, you know, if you go to the podiatrist with a headache, I'll probably defame everyone by the end of this, but, you know, if you go to the podiatrist with a headache, they'll tell you your flat feet and need art supports. If you go to the osteopath with a headache, they'll tell you your pelvis is not equal and not level, so you need uh, an insert in the short leg, even though no leg is short. If you go to the chiropractor with a headache, they'll tell you your back's crooked, you need a manipulation. And if you go to the optometrist with a headache, they'll tell you you're short-sighted and need glasses. Now, that's an extreme example, but that's the sort of thing I see. So you're sort of getting adrift what I think about RFA. It's got a role to play. The other thing is, too, if you don't move fast enough and the RFA hasn't worked, the, the pain management guy or girl will want to put a spinal cord stimulator in. That's fine if you've got failed surgery, a non-operative problem, terrible referred pain from some hideous metastatic or cancerous deposit. But, you know, I've seen people who came to ask me for advice who you do a standing X-ray and they've got a two-level spondy from facet joint disease. They need a fusion. They don't, they don't need spinal cord stimulators. So they all have a role to play, but only in certain instances, not as a first line of treatment. And why don't fusions work? The literature would suggest that 60 to 80% improvement in your back pain if you do a fusion. Now, you're not comparing apples and orange, apples and apples, like, you know, why don't knee replacements work? Not all of them do, but you've got to set realistic goals. And also, why are you fusing them? Are you fusing someone I showed you like a degenerate disc? and above it they've got stenosis and a slip, that's a chip shot. Or the hard one is if they've got worn out discs and it's how you fuse it. So I see a lot of people who have a standalone anterior fusion, they've still got symptoms because the reasons I said, my experience and belief is they toggle through the facet joints and you've got to back them up. So 
Sometimes you need to fine tune things. Sometimes, you know, they still have symptoms, but that's not that it hasn't worked. So it, it, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, you can't treat backache in a fat slob. So, you know, someone with a bulging disc and some non-specific back pain, you know, fusion is, is not a joke and you've got to do all surgery. It's a last resort. It's a last resort. But I agree with you. I have plenty of people who you look at or you see them for second opinions or your own patient and they're just not doing that well. And it's not just work cover. And I guess in, in the medico legal world, if you've got a good x-ray and a good outcome, everyone's happy. If there's a problem on the x-ray, but the outcome's good, it doesn't matter. But if there's a bad outcome and the x-ray is anything less than perfect, then it must be surgical misadventure, which is not the case. You know, sure, if the screw is digging into a nerve or something, but, you know, just because something is slightly amiss, it doesn't translate into symptoms. Um, so it is very hard. There's a big body, you know, led by my... He is actually my friend, Ian Harris, you know, and that woman in Melbourne, Rachel Bookbinder, you know, treatment of back pain is bad. Surgeons shouldn't be involved. Few, there is no doubt the rate of fusion is much, much more. It's about 200% more than 20 years ago. And not everyone is amenable to surgery. I mean, if you treat the x-rays, absolutely. But you just, I mean, you've you've got to just do it in the, if you think it's right to do and do the best technical job you can, having warned them that it needs a big effort on their part and it's not an instant fix, you know. It's months of work and physiotherapy and core strengthening to get better. So I still believe. Uh, you know, I still do fusions, maybe not as many as I used to because there's an oversupply of surgeons and also because in the older osteoporotic, I've learned from bitter experience to really go slow on them. Um, but still it works. It's a great operation if done for the right reasons. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and argue. Of course, there's people who don't do as well as you would hope as they would hope. And then you've got the return to work because a lot of with work cover, a lot of people who need spine surgery are still of a working age. They have heavy physical jobs. English might be their second language. They've been down the coal mines or on the building site since they were 15 years old. And even though surgery might help them, it won't help them to the point that they can get back to what they do or what they used to do. So that's an issue too. You know, I like people to be primarily that they're a lot better. They're off all the rubbish they were taking and that they can get back to some form of useful existence. Um, so... The success, the word success or work encompasses all that, not just the technical side of the surgery. The, hopefully that helps you a bit. But it, it's not a chip shot. It's not like putting a need, pulling a needle out of a foot. Sophia? Yep. Uh, yeah, so that's... Um, so does anyone have any other questions? You can just unmute yourself and just come forward. Um. I, I can't see anything, so... Oh. Ashley, sorry, I've got two questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got one question, Ashley. So what are your thoughts on the use of PRP within spinal fusion surgery or any surgery? It's Can not you see me? <laughs> my, yeah. One of my partners does a lot of PRP, but for joints, peripherally and soft tissue stuff. I, I don't know that it's got any role to play in spine. I've not heard of it. Um, someone wanted to do, I mean, all the time in knees, you know, PRP is a good short-term fix for some people. People who are, there's nothing to treat arthroscopically. They're not ready for a knee replacement. I think there is a psychological component to it. It helps, but only in the short term in the best of circumstances. But you've got to do three lots. I, I don't know that there's any studies or experience with doing it into the spine. So, you know, there's some punter, I think, at Bondo Junction in Sydney who does prolotherapy, I don't even remember whether it's hypertonic saline or glucose, injects into trigger points. I mean, that's just witchcraft. That's good luck rather than good planning. And I suspect if you're doing that with PRP, it's the same. You know, it's it's injections into the spine. To do an epidural is a waste of time. You don't get bang for your buck. You've got to target a nerve or a facet joint and you get an up to 70% relief in some way. Might be a bit, it might be a lot, might be for short term, might be for a long term. But, um, you know, PRP is not a thing in spine, as far as I know. Okay. Um, we actually have three or four more questions. Yeah, um, I'm so, right. um, and then... You've disappeared. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. So there has been an upward trend of injured workers not bad enough for surgery, but reported no. 
that in, for a spinal stimulator to be appropriate after failed injections or or never, never, um, never. So never. what are your thoughts on when a spinal stimulator is resolved? Well, I sort of alluded to that to, to that before when answering about RFAs. I think spinal cord stimulators have a role to play. But if you injure your back at work, uh, you know, with a physical injury, I mean, it needs in, it needs investigation, I think, should be seen if they're not getting better, as one would hope. I think should be seen by a surgeon, just to exclude. Pain management guys are physicians and they can't exclude a surgical cause, okay? A surgeon can. So I won't offer someone advice about their diabetes management or their blood pressure management. These guys can't can't either. So I think as a first lord of line of treatment, I think it's fraught with danger and risk. And I don't think it's appropriate at all. But it does have a role to play, not as a first line of treatment. Yep. Um, yep. Thank you. And another question is how many times can an area be intervened on by decompression before they are at risk of that segment or being or another being destabilized? When you decompress them, okay, as long as you don't disrupt the facet joints, uh, like if, if, you, if you destroy a facet joint, which tends to happen in an older person, you're doomed to become unstable. Um, you can probably decompress them twice. Uh, that's for a laminectomy. With a disc, if they get a if you do a discectomy, they're good, that's fine. And then bang, three, six months later, another disc comes out at the same level. You could probably do that again as long as they don't have much back pain. You, they don't have those horrible modic changes. The disc is worn out and really unstable. You know, that they've just got a, a slip disc again and leg pain. I, I will often go in and just do that. Well, often, you know, in the, in the rare instances it happens to me, um, you know, you I would still always just treat the leg pain. Fusion's the last resort. But it's a good question. I mean, this at some point you need to pull the plug. You know, I've had people who maybe I've done one disc, someone else has done another, they come back again and said, really, you're wasting your time. You need, and there's no disc left to cut out. You know, it's just now that the disc is weak and wobbly and the nerve is stuck in scar tissue and that's why they're getting leg pain, not because anything's pushing on it. So to go back in and look again is a waste of time, okay? And the other instance that's a waste of time is if they've got pars defects and a slip, uh, and they've got a bit of uncovering of the disc. Oh, just do the disc, see how I go. It it will not work. It will not work. Early on in my career, I got bullied by a patient doing that. I did it. He's a nice guy. He liked me. He, of course, he didn't do any good. But he just was adamant he didn't want a fusion. And he he basically nagged me, convinced me. But I today, I just say, I can't help you. If you want that, go to someone else. I wish you all the best. Um yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. So we have two more and yep. we're actually running out of time. So these will be the last two questions. Um, mm -hmm. So first is, it was interesting to hear your preference on an on anterior approach fusions. Do you consider an insurer should be paying for two surgeons on an anterior approach? Good question. Um... <laughs> As a member of the Australian Society of Orthopaedic Surgeons, um, yes, of course. I mean, at some stage, the cost. I guess what's happened, because you guys, I don't know who signed this deal with Sarah 20-odd years ago, that all work cover stuff was 150% AMA rates. I mean, I don't know who signed that, but God, it was good for me for the first 20 years of my practice. But now it's gone back to AMA rates. So a lot of people said, oh, I'm not going to do it for that. To hell with them, you know. I just think I think the payments are fair and reasonable for that, but the, in this medico legal day and age, if if you're doing it by yourself and cause a vascular injury, and you know shit happens in surgery, as long as you recognise it and can deal with it, happened to me in the times I used to do it myself. But it gets very lonely and scary out there when it's ten o'clock at night and there's no backup out there, you know. So I think it's safer to do it. Um, in theory, you're doing less to operating because you're not dissecting down, but in practice, you're making it safer. So I, th I think there needs to be a meeting halfway. Like maybe the fee is what it is, but it's a bit less and the vascular surgeons get some, or we can charge a little bit more and pay the vascular surgeons ourselves. But I understand as a payer why you ask that, and it makes sense. Certainly at the end of the day, we are doing less surgery by physically not opening it up. Uh, and the vascular guy needs to get 
recompense for his ex his or her expertise. So I don't quite know how to answer that without either shooting myself in the foot or copying slack from my colleagues, flack from my colleagues. But it's a good question and it's a valid point because all this stuff, you can't keep charging a fortune for everything and expect it to continue on. The thing that annoys me most about everything is not work cover. It's actually the rebates from uh, health funds because I, I mainly work in Cogra and there's a lot of pensioners there and they're real pensioners. They're not Coin Piper pensioners. They're asset rich. They might have a nice house, but they got no cash and they struggle to pay their health fund. And, you know, what I charge and what the health funds generously give me for operating on them is 50% of what I can charge. And I can live with that except my indemnity the spine surgeons are up there with obstetrics and cosmetic surgeons. You know, it's seemed as really high risk, deemed as really high risk. I pay a fortune. I pay two to three times what my orthopedic colleagues do because I'm dumb enough to do spine surgery. So you can't do it for nothing. And it, it is a problem. It is a problem. But to go back to the original query, I think it's safer. It's better. There's less complications. No one's quite looked at it, but empirically that is the case. And there's a steady supply of medical legal issues going back to surgeons taking on revision surgery by themselves anteriorly without a vascular surgeon. I mean, that's just negligent as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, so it is vital, but I can understand where the question is coming from and I don't write it off at all. I've chickened out of answering you, though. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so this will be our last question for today. Um, this is coming from Michelle. Um, she asked if a worker has had injections in other body parts and it didn't work, in your opinion, would it then be reasonable to skip that step and go straight to surgery? Or excellent. should an injection be tried first? Yeah, and excellent question because a lot of people say, oh, no, but I had a cortisone for my tennis elbow. It didn't work. You're treating a different disease, different condition, so that's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. OK, the other big fear about cortisone, because everyone out there is an expert. Uh, oh, but I've heard these needles. One needle will make my bone soft, will give me cancer, will make me fat, will give me heart disease. La, 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 la. You know, it's a one off. Systemically, it has no significant effects whatsoever. And it has an up to 70 percent chance of helping some way. So just because it's helped in the past and uh, not helped in the past treating other conditions, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And I'll always try and convince patients if I think. But then when you get someone with a huge disc screaming the house down with leg pain, I just say you can try a cortisone. I, I suspect at best it's going to give you very fleeting relief and you're wasting your time. You're delaying the inevitable. So I still think and a lot of the time it is worth doing. And, and also the other thing you explained, it's not like you need to keep doing it to keep the petrol tank full. It's a one-off. It either helps or it doesn't help. End of story. So it's still a valuable thing in your armamentarium. What annoys me as the clinician is when you get these rote letters back from Mr. Uh, insurance firm, um, what are the indications for the injection? What is the medical proof? Uh, what is the, you know, it's complete rubbish, you know, sort of what's, what's the, it's like asking what's the medical proof of penicillin if you've got an infection. I mean, it's sort of part of practice that exists. It's good practice. You know, there's certain things that are a bit controversial, but these sort of rote questions uh they're a bit silly, I think. But yes, cortisone injections have a place to play. I don't do them myself. I send them off. Some people, very rarely, but some people do have a true allergy to either, not so much the cortisone, but the carrier it comes in. And they get not anaphylaxis, but really unpleasant reactions. So then you can't do it. But the bottom line is if they've had an injection somewhere else just because it didn't work, so what? You're treating a different condition. Uh, yep. So thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. A lot of people saying that it was a very informative session. Um, it was amazing. And yeah, um, I guess we're going to wrap up the seminar today. And thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Rosenberg. We really okay. appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining. All right. Yep. I'm going to stop recording.